Coombs reagent, or the anti-human globulin, and you see if anti-IgG and C3 act, and then you go to try to identify what the antigen is. The indirect Coombs is really only useful for transfusion reactions and alloimmunization kind of problems, again, when maternal fetal problems as well. So immune hemolytic anemia, there's a few types. There's autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there's drug-induced hemolytic anemia, there's transfusion-related hemolytic anemia, and they're distinguished by the history and identification of the specific antibody coating the red blood cell or the results of your direct antiglobulin or Coombs test. Let's talk about the non-immune hemolytic anemia. Again, you're not going to really see a lot of spherocytes on these patients, and the Coombs test will be negative. So there are two basic categories. There's the acquired and the inherited. Let's talk about G6PD deficiency. Hemolysis occurs during oxidant stress by a drug toxin or infection. So, and primarily the drugs involved are permaquin, sulfa, dapsone, nitroferentoin. You can see bite cells on the smear, but it's not specific for the disease. The thing to keep in mind is that the A-minus variant is what you see in African Americans is associated with self-limited hemolytic flares. And the thing to remember is that only the older red blood cells are affected. So in a patient who is actively hemolyzing and you have a lot of reticulocytosis, there's actually a normal level of G6PD, and so their G6PD screen is actually negative. But if you were to test them after their hemolytic flare is over with, their G6PD level will actually be low. And so you retest them in a few weeks and you'll make the diagnosis. Now the Mediterranean variant is a lot more severe. The G6PD screen is always abnormal since all red blood cells are affected. Some of you may remember, uh, probably in med school, you were told about favism and people who ate these fava beans getting massive hemolytic crisis. And a lot of them are a Mediterranean variant and have this other variant of G6PD deficiency. Now there is a number of other variants. These are the two major ones. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and I'm just going to touch on this. Things to remember, schistocytes are seen on the peripheral smear. Think about TTP, and the only thing I'm going to say about this, remember the five things, although you don't need all five. Fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal disease, and neurologic abnormalities, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Think DIC if the coagulation times are abnormal. Also think about prosthetic valves causing a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Sickle cell disorders, you have SS, SC, and sickle beta thal, and probably the degree of severity is in descending order, so SS is more severe than SC, and which is more severe than sickle beta thal. Again, that's a generalization, and there are variations in all of that. And it's characterized by vaso-occlusion and chronic hemolysis. It can affect virtually every organ system. Sickle trait, again, is not associated with clinical abnormalities. Death arises from infection. Think about streptococcus, think about H. influenza, and think about salmonella, especially with osteomyelitis. Death also comes from stroke and acute chest syndrome. To manage pain, you use non-steroidals, narcotics, and fluids. We really have not progressed much in the way of treatment of sickle cell disease over the past many, many years. There are a number of experimental therapies, including nitrous oxide, anticoagulation, steroids, and this Paloxomer 188, which is a surfactant that decreases adhesion of the sickle cells to the endothelial wall. Exchange or simple transfusions are indicated for stroke or acute chest syndrome, but they're not indicated for routine pain crisis. Remember, in patients who get a lot of transfusions, you have to think about iron overload, and you may need to chelate them. Hydroxyurea is used for in patients, and it increases the hemoglobin F level, it decreases the incidence of acute chest syndrome, and the number of pain crises. And recently, like a couple of months ago, the nine-year data was published on patients who got hydroxyurea, and it suggested that there definitely was a decrease in mortality. So there is a mortality benefit of these patients being on hydroxyurea. Let's talk a little bit about acute chest syndrome, because I think that's one of the important things with sickle cell. The definition is a new infiltrate, fever, and respiratory symptoms. Again, it is exactly what you're going to see with pneumonia, and so you treat it similarly. The etiology is unclear. It may be a combination of vascular infarction, fat embolism, infection, hypoventilation, pulmonary edema. You treat with antibiotics, oxygen, incentospirometry, control their pain, fluid management, transfusions. You can use simple transfusion or exchange transfusions. 
again, simple transfusions, you're just giving blood, exchange transfusion, you're taking blood out and giving blood non-sickled blood, especially if the hematocrit is towards the high end, like in the 29, 28, 29 range, you definitely want to do exchange transfusions because you don't want the hematocrit to go too high because that actually will increase the viscosity and actually make the sickle crisis worse. And again, experimental therapies like nitric oxide inhalation and steroids. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. The hemolysis is caused by an impaired synthesis of a membrane anchor protein at the stem cell level. This manifests as hemolytic anemia, venous thrombosis, uh, but Chiari sinus thrombosis, and deficient hematopoiesis. The hemoglobinuria can be present intermittently. So if you get a case of the patient who comes in, and you may not get the hemoglobinuria, but they have kind of this atypical thrombosis, like but Chiari, which is thrombosis of the hepatic vein, or sinus thrombosis, or renal vein thrombosis, or something like that, and you see that they have a hemolytic anemia, think paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. You may or may not, again, have the hemoglobinuria. A percentage of patients with aplastic anemia will develop PNH. You diagnose this by flow cytometry. CD55, CD59 will be at low levels or be missing completely. And that concludes this edition of Audio Digest, a twice monthly publication of the Audio Digest Foundation, a nonprofit affiliate of the California Medical Association. Our thanks to Dr. Solkowski and Asher, and to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine for their cooperation in the production of this issue. This program is copyright 2003. <laughs> Based in blood, hepatitis C, and anemia on Audio Digest Internal Medicine, Volume 50, Issue 19, for the week of October 7, 2003. Featuring selections from two Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine meetings, topics in clinical medicine, Medicine and Internal Medicine Board Review at Johns Hopkins, beginning with Hepatitis C, Identification and Eradication, presented by Mark Solkowski, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Johns Hopkins. First, I want to talk a little bit about the virus itself. One of the most important things over the past decade has been the recognition of hepatitis C as a viral pathogen. It's a flavin virus, a positive strand RNA. We've also begun to learn about its viral kinetics. Like HIV, this virus has a tremendous daily virion production, estimated at a trillion virions a day, with a very short pathway. Picture a tremendous amount of viral turnover inside the liver and the serum. In addition, it has an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, the important thing with this enzyme is that it makes mistakes and induces mutations or errors. The consequence is genetic diversity. Now, as we talk about treatment, we'll see that this already plays an important role in how human subjects respond to therapy. There are six major strains of hepatitis C spread throughout the world, known as genotypes. In the United States, genotype 1 predominates, affecting nearly 75% of those affected. Now, among African Americans living in the U.S., that number is nearly 95% with genotype 1. As we'll talk about, genotype 1 does not respond as well to current treatments. Genotype 2 and 3 make up the rest of the infections found in this country, and it's more responsive. Other countries, such as Egypt, have very high rates of genotype 4. So the genetic diversity plays a big role in how patients respond to treatment. Then within an individual patient, within weeks of infection, the virus mutation that can be found as what's known as a quasi-species, a swarm, if you will, of about 10 or 12 different variants. So this diversity almost certainly leads to chronicity as well as failure to respond to therapy. As I alluded to, this is truly a global problem. WHO estimates there are nearly 400 million persons living worldwide with hepatitis C. Now in the U.S., this number is estimated to be around 5 million. But if you look at some parts of the world, such as Egypt, which I alluded to, it's estimated between 10 and 15 million people are infected, mostly through an attempt to eradicate just the psoriasis. Persons were infected and these were reused in this attempt. But throughout the world, hepatitis C remains a very important pathogen. In the U.S., as we'll talk about, the epidemic is now entering its third and fourth decade, and the prevalence of liver disease as a result of that C is increasing. 
Now, in the United States, the data come primarily from a study called NPAINS. This was a survey of Americans living outside of institutions, so it did not include prisoners or hospitalized patients. From this data, the estimates are 4 million chronically infected persons. There are differences according to ethnicity. Among African Americans, the rates were significantly higher than among Caucasians. So if you took one subset, that is, African American men between the age of 30 and 60, the prevalence rate was as many as 1 in 10. If you take a...